you for joining us for worship for Sunday, June 2nd with Atonement Lutheran Church. We're excited to have you all with us, both here in person and online. Uh, my name's Gene. I'm the pastor here, and I invite you to please stand if you are able as we begin worship with the confession and forgiveness. We confess our sins before God and one another. God of mercy, we bring our broken selves to you. The afflictions we suffer and those we inflict on others, ourselves, and the world. We are sorry for the hurt we have caused. We trust your promise of forgiveness and await your life-giving word. Amen. Our Lord, who knows the deepest and darkest corners of our hearts, never fails to forgive our shortcomings. Receive that grace and know the freedom won for us through Christ our Savior. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. pray. Gracious God, you never hold our sins against us, create in us forgiving hearts which follow their maker's loving example. In the name of the one who first loved us. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the second chapter of 2 Corinthians. So I made up my mind not to make you another painful visit. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I am confident about all of you that my joy would be the joy of all of you. For I wrote you out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but to some extent, not to exaggerate it, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. So now, instead, you should forgive and console him so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote for this reason, to test you 
and to know whether you are in be obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we move into the second chapter of 2 Corinthians today, I think a little background will be helpful. Because so we get some interesting statements from St. Paul here without much context. Right? We, we hear that he decided not to make you another painful visit. And I wrote you out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. What was going on? Now, the obvious assumption would be that, that Paul was referring back to the letter we know as 1 Corinthians, which we just spent about a month reading through pieces of. But it's not that simple. See, scholars actually believe that letter that we call 1 Corinthians was the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, not the first one. And the letter that we call 2 Corinthians that we read from this morning is believed not to be the second but the fourth letter that Paul wrote to that church. So we're missing the first letter and the third letter out of four that we've been able to identify. They got the names 1 and 2 Corinthians because, of course, they're the two that we have. So the letter that St. Paul refers to here, the one written out of so much distress and anguish and tears, it's a letter that was probably written between the two Corinthian letters that we do have, but has since been lost. Even without those, that letter, though, we, we've pieced together a fair amount of what was going on and what St. Paul's relationship with this church in Corinth was like. We know that the first Corinthians letter was sent with Timothy in hopes of resolving conflicts and issues of immorality that St. Paul had learned about. And we know that Timothy's visit failed. And that caused Paul to rearrange his travel plans so that he could make a hasty visit himself to Corinth. And apparently, St. Paul's tone was too conciliatory on that visit because he had no more success than Timothy did. And not only did Paul fail, but some individual in the Corinthian church whose name is never mentioned insulted or offended St. Paul during his stay with them. So that's the painful visit that St. Paul mentioned here. Painful both because he failed at his intended purpose, but also due to whatever that affront was that he suffered while there. So after Paul left Corinth and arrived, in Asia, he wrote a very stern letter to the Corinthians, his third actual letter to them. And in that letter, which is now lost, he claimed that he wrote it out of distress and anguish and so many tears. And that letter had several effects. First, it convinced the church to publicly rebuke whoever it was that injured Paul. And in their society, in which honor and shame were much more important than they are to us, this was incredibly painful for someone to endure such a public rebuke. It was not out of the ordinary for individuals to commit suicide to avoid the shame caused by this kind of public rebuke. And that was not St. Paul's goal. So the letter worked too well in that sense. And 
unfortunately, the letter also caused great pain to the church itself. St. Paul had presented himself as grieving over what had happened on his visit. And that was a very serious, forceful form of moral rebuke at that time. So now, in the letter we know as 2 Corinthians that we have before us today, St. Paul is trying to deal with the pain caused both to that one individual who had offended Paul and also to the whole congregation who were injured by Paul's previous rebuke of them. Got that all straight? <laughs> there was a lot going on. It was complicated. It was messy, right? Something we gladly know nothing about in the modern church. Sin is insidious. In our individualistic society today, we tend to think of sin as individually as anything else. We tend to think of sin as between you and me, or me and you, right? But it's almost never that simple. One of my favorite examples of how sin affects a whole community is from a movie called The Mission. Some of you may remember this from back in the mid 80s. It's about a group of Jesuit monks in the 18th century who try to protect a remote South American Indian tribe from falling under the rule of pro-slavery Portugal, which is not entirely historically accurate, but it made for a really good movie. Some of you may remember, at the center of the story, our captain Rodrigo Mendoza, played by Robert De Niro, and Father Gabriel, played by Jeremy Irons. I don't know if he actually played the oboe. I kind of doubt it. Captain Mendoza is a mercenary and a slave trader at the beginning of the film. We witness him take to be slaves a, a dozen or more of the indigenous Guarani who lived above the massive Iguazu Falls. When Mendoza returns from this particular trip, he's heartbroken to discover his fiance with his half-brother. And so he challenges him to a duel and kills his half-brother. Now, although he is acquitted by the local governor, a slave-holding client of his, Mendoza wallows in, in self-pity and he sinks into a deep depression. Father Gabriel lives with and serves the Guarani above the falls. But on one of his visits below the falls, he hears about what has happened to Mendoza, goes to visit him, and while there challenges him to move past his depression in an interesting way. And Mendoza claims, for me there is no redemption. But Father Gabriel pushes back and accuses him of being a coward, both for murdering his brother and in his life since. Father Gabriel tells him, God gave us the burden of freedom. You chose your crime. Do you have the courage to choose your penance? And Mendoza replies, there is no penance hard enough for me. But do you dare try it? Do I dare? Do you dare to see it fail? And with this challenge, Mendoza ends up deciding to go with Father Gabriel and the other Jesuits up to their mission above Iguazu Falls. So in a grueling series of scenes, we watch as Mendoza endures his self-determined penance, as he attempts to scale the falls, which are treacherous at any time. He is weighed down by a large netted sack, roughly twice, maybe three times his size, bulging with all manner of armor and swords and other weapons. 
They are, literally and figuratively, the trappings of his former life. As you can imagine, climbing the slick, rocky falls with this huge weight tied to him is incredibly difficult. It slows him way down, which slows the whole group down. He struggles, and the others in the group join him in his struggle by helping him to try to climb the falls. His sin literally weighs down all of them and holds them all back. At one point, when the burdensome net is stuck on some undergrowth, one of the Jesuits hacks it off and lets it fall. He has released Mendoza from the burden of his sin. Or so it would seem. But Mendoza climbs down, retrieves the sack, reties it, and resumes the climb. Now, maybe none of you can identify with that. But Father Gabriel comments that he does not think he's done with his penance and comments, until he does, neither do I. Finally, after days of climbing in this fashion, the Jesuits arrive at the top of the falls where they're greeted by many of the Guarani. And this joyful reunion is cut short when several of the children notice Captain Mendoza come around a corner. The Guarani exchange a few words that are not translated for us, and one of them then runs, grabs a long knife, sprints over to where Mendoza is panting down on all fours. And that Guarani yanks Mendoza up by the rope attaching him to that net, and holds the knife to his neck, yelling furiously at him. After several tense moments, during which the other Guarani and Jesuits have now gathered around closer, there's a brief exchange between Father Gabriel and someone who appears to be one of, if not the leader of the Guarani. And again, what's said is not translated for us. But the result is that that Guarani leader shouts something to the one holding Mendoza at knife point. That Guarani immediately yanks again on the rope, but this time begins furiously cutting it with his knife. After a few quick strokes, the rope is severed, and he pushes and kicks that large sack to the edge of a short cliff where it falls into the river below, and then quickly disappears over another drop in the falls. Mendoza's initial weeping turns into full-on sobs, and then a strange mixture of sobbing and laughing. And Father Gabriel comes over to hug him, and the two rock back and forth in their embrace. A look of joy and relief shines from Mendoza's face. The Jesuits and Guarani laugh in celebration as well, and soon after, Mendoza has become one of the Jesuits and is serving the Guarani. The whole ordeal is a striking portrayal of sin and penance and forgiveness on many levels. The way Mendoza struggles with the weight of everything that made up his former life illustrates so well the weight of sin that we have all experienced in our own lives. We allow and and sometimes even choose our past to determine so much more than it should. That sin that we carry with us not only holds us back, but holds many of those around us back as well. Mendoza would not have made it up the falls without the help he received from the Jesuits traveling with him. When burdened with the weight of sin, we all need a community around us who can help us struggle. And this, of course, can be incredibly frustrating for those of us in that community who are helping. 
But often the best we can do is to help that person struggling to keep moving forward. When we try to dismiss their sins out of our frustration, it will not work. Mendoza did not accept the Jesuit releasing him from his burdens. And rightly so. He had not sinned against that Jesuit. He had sinned primarily against the Guarani. So it was only when the Guarani forgave him that it truly mattered to him. It was only when one of the Guarani released him from that burden that he could leave it behind for good. Mendoza could not free himself from that bondage. But the Jesuits couldn't rightly free him from it either. I hope you hear in this example how powerful forgiveness can be for a community. I hope you hear how powerful your declaration of forgiveness can be for someone burdened by their sin. And I hope you hear why it is so important for us as a congregation to be a place of forgiveness and reconciliation, as well as a place that is willing to struggle and endure with one another in the midst of their sin and penance. God intends community, intends the church to be a blessing. The church is intended to be a place of, of acceptance of people as they are, of expectation that people grow in the faith and not be stagnant, a place of forgiveness when people fail or fall, when they insult, when they offend, when they inflict pain on others, and a place where fellow travelers are found to journey with us when we struggle with the weight of our sin. The church is expected to be a place of, of grace and forgiveness and new life. That's what's supposed to be attractive about the church. Most days, we're still working on the same balance that St. Paul and the Corinthian church were struggling with. We're publicly working out. That balancing of expectations of a godly life and loving community with the realities of our own sin and our needs for penance and forgiveness. Above all, the church is a place where there is ultimately redemption for everyone including you. Amen.
please stand as you are able. We pray for the ch <clears throat> we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Forgiving God, the punishments this world inflicts are more than enough. Give us strength to stand against the tide and be the first to forgive we who have been so generously forgiven. Lord, in your mercy. Your Loving creator, have mercy on us for all the ways we disrespect and abuse your creation, ourselves included. Bring us to a more compassionate relationship with all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Prayer. Dear Lord, when we offer our forgiveness to others, we do it on behalf of you. Envelop this world in the grace it so desperately needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in pain of mind, of heart, or body. Today we pray especially for Bev Weber's cousin, Mike's year-old grandson, Dalton, as he recovers from surgery on his pancreas. Provide comfort and healing for Dalton, as only you can. Grant to all who are ill or in pain freedom from their suffering and knowledge of your forgiveness and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember those who precede us in death, sad to be without their physical presence, but joyous in their perfect union with you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share a sign of God's peace with those around you and online in the comments. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
sanitizer to use if you would wish. That's also where you will find individually wrapped gluten-free wafers that you may take if you would like or need that option. As you continue forward, there will be a station to either side where you can receive uh, one of our regular wafers and then your choice of wine, which is red, or grape juice, which is white. And finally, there is a basket uh, at the end on each side where you may place your used communion cup before returning to your seat. Now please come for all things are ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I invite our community assistants to come forward first, please.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life now and forever. Amen. There are several things we want to make sure you're aware are going on, but this is not everything happening here at Atonement. For that, please check your Sunday morning announcement email. Uh, that's where you'll find uh, a complete list and complete information even about some of the things that I'm going to mention here in a moment. If you don't receive that email and would like to, you can sign up on our website or using one of the Connect cards which are in the pocket of the seat in front of you. Uh, going on right now, our veteran collection, and that actually ends today, I believe. And so if you were going to be a part of that, um, we hope you brought that today. For all of you who have been a part of that, thank you. Uh, there is also still time to make a financial donation to that effort if you would like to do so. Um, also today, there is a bake sale being held by um, our Church in Society Committee and proceeds uh, go to the Safe Babies Healthy Families uh, picnic that you've heard about a little bit in the last couple of weeks. And so we hope that you, uh, if you didn't on the way in, that you stop at the table on the way out and check out all the delicious baked goods that are available. Um, we're going to be congratulating our graduating seniors next week, June 9th, at our outdoor service. And um, each one of them are going to be given a special uh, blanket uh, to let them know that atonement goes with them into whatever endeavors they are headed for next. Uh, so you may want to consider joining us for that special celebration next week outside at our 10 o'clock service. And then coming up on Father's Day, the uh, Kids Blast kids are going to spend some of their time in Kids Blast preparing rip your floats for dads and anyone else, I think, who wants one. Um, and so that will be on June 16th, Father's Day, and since they'll be doing that during Kids Blast, that will be after the 10 o'clock service. That also lets us hold it outside, which might mean a little easier cleanup for us. Uh, we have a new hearing loop induction system installed, and uh, I know some people have already started using that. Uh, this is uh, particularly for people who have hearing aids that have a telecoil or a T setting in it. So if you have a T setting on your, um, on your hearing aid, um, check that out. You should get much, much better um, sound than just tr picking up uh, with the hearing aid what is in the room. And if there are any issues with that as we continue um, to, to tweak it and make it as good as possible, please let us know. Um, but we think we've got it working uh, pretty well right now, so please make use of that. And if you know someone, um, who would benefit from using that. Please mention it to them as well. And then actually a couple of transition updates. Um, first, I'm going to mention a non-pastoral one, which is that um, our custodian from the past two years, Vic Montoya Silva, um, has finished his last day with us. Uh, he, um, he gave his two-week notice two weeks ago um, because when he took this job two years ago, um, he was already in uh, school learning to be a barber. And uh, so we knew that that was coming. And he not only has graduated and started um, barbering, but he's gotten to the point where he has enough clientele that he's working full time. And coming over here part time was becoming increasingly difficult. And so we were like, great. I mean, we don't like to see you go, but you know, congratulations on doing so well at, in your chosen field. So um, he is gone, and uh, we have posted that job description um, on our website. If you know someone who might be looking for 10 or 15 hours of work during the week, um, if that's something that you want to consider um, on an ongoing basis or even on a temporary basis over the summer, or know someone who would like to, please let us know. Uh, the other transition coming is that uh, tomorrow, Deacon Doug Kreckling will begin working with us. 
Um, we have contracted with him to be here uh, roughly half time. He's going to be here um, all but one Sunday a month in um, worship or other activities on Sunday morning and then putting in about 20 hours a week with us. Uh, he brings lots of experience um, both in ministry and um, outside of ministry that we're looking forward to, uh, to having him share with us. And so um, starting in worship next Sunday, um, please uh, come expecting to give a warm welcome uh, to Deacon Doug as he joins us in ministry here. Last but not least, uh, thank you for your ongoing uh, support, financial and otherwise, here at Atonement. Um, but financially speaking, if you brought an, uh, if you brought, um, an offering with you, you can leave that in one of the offering plates that are by the doors to the sanctuary. Uh, and we have many ways to give online and through Realm, including the text to give option that you see on our screen. Um, like I said, thank you for your ongoing generous support. I invite you to now please stand to receive the benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.